And uh, so we're going to be uh, finishing up, actually, our, here we are at the end of uh, the greatest sermon ever preached, right? And I'm not talking about the one I pre- I've preached <laughs> along the way, but that Jesus brought to us. I just get the privilege of being able to say it to you again and again and again. And um, I-, I hope that the words, honestly, I hope the words have been uh, both an encouragement to each one of us. But also, I hope that they've been a bit of a challenge to us, right? Not just merely an encouragement, but a challenge to the the way of Christ that is kind of this upside-down, seeming world, right? The way that he calls us to. That's very different than what the world calls us to. And and today, Jesus finishes his sermon out with uh, two final warnings to us, to the listeners. And that we should do well to heed them. And, you know, honestly, if you look at the light of the Sermon on the Mount, it's... Have you noticed that a lot of it is warning passages? There are a lot of things in the ways that maybe we're doing something incorrectly that we need to change based on the heart behind them, right? I think many Christians throughout the ages have been easily deceived in a true understanding of what Christ has called us to and how true kingdom living should be. And so what I want to do, I want to read. We're going to be in, at the end of the sermon, verse, chapter 7, verses 21 through 29. If you would, read along with me if you have your Bibles Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? And didn't we do many powerful deeds in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. De- go away from me, you lawbreakers. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. The rain fell, the flood came, and the winds beat against that house, but it did not collapse because its ha- foundation had been laid on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the flood came, and the winds beat against the house, and it collapsed. It was utterly destroyed. And when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed by his teaching because he taught them like one who had authority and not like they're experts in the law. You know, as I was uh, preparing this sermon this week, I even texted the staff, and I was just like, you know, I read this, and I don't know if any of you all feel this way or not, but I, I kind of, I was reading this, and I, I felt like it's a little conversation back and forth between Jesus. I'm, I'm reading this, and I'm going, okay, let me sit on the side. I'm like, I, I sit over here, and I go, yeah, you know, uh, Jesus and me, we're, we're on good terms. I mean, he's my Lord, right? To which Jesus kind of like turns to me and he says, he's like, well, uh, yeah, you, you say that you know me, but it's not really about that. It's about what you do, right? Then I go, okay, okay, Jesus, uh, I, I do those things I'm called to, great things even, so we're good, right? No, no, you're wicked. I don't know you. Okay, uh, wait, so it's... Not about what I do then, right, Jesus? Wrong. Only if you do what I say, you'll be good to go. And I'm like, well, which is it? Is it what I do or what I don't do? Is it something else? And I, I don't know. I don't know about you, but I read this, and I feel like he's going back and forth. Anybody? It's kind of like, do it, but don't do it. It matters if you know me or you don't know me, or maybe you should do it. Maybe, well, maybe not. Now, anyway, I said back and forth. Can, and so the question is, can we make sense of this passage? I'm going to give it a shot. I, I hope that, uh, that it helps at the end of this, kind of going through one of these things where he almost seems a bit contradictory to what he's saying. And I think to begin with, I think we need to understand that Jesus is finishing out, yet again, warning passages that we looked at from last week. If you recall what, he was speaking against what last week? Anybody remember? Who was he speaking against last week? False prophets, right, false prophets. And recognizing those false prophets by their what? The fruit that they produce, good. And I think this is a continued warning because if we're not careful, right, we can easily get caught up not only in the words of those who were false, but even sometimes even more the what? 
the deeds that they do, the deeds of others that seem miraculous. Last week, we looked at the prophet's false words and saw the lives they lived behind them, but now Jesus is warning against falling for the miraculous signs that false prophets can often produce, even ones that seem quite a bit shocking, all right? And the hardest part of it all, I think, is the fact that they do all of these things, what? In the name of Jesus. False prophets use Jesus' name to do amazing things, teach amazing things, Yes. You know, I, I personally, some of you may know the story or whatever, I, I personally have been involved in a ministry where leaders who, on one hand, they speak many, they've spoken many prophecies, things about what's going to happen, speaking these things out, even uh, claim to cast out demons. Actually, in the last three days, in response to a Tucker Carlson video, even tweeted about how they've done the very same thing, that Tucker Carlson needs to be released from those demons, and he was willing to do it. All the while, in doing that, claiming that he was our Moses. Not like, like Moses, but our Moses. And as such, we were to follow him in leading wherever he might take that ministry. To which I simply said... No, thank you, which is why I'm here with you today, actually. It's where I've come from. So it's not something, this is not something that's out of the realm of possibility. This is something where I was just a mere three and a half years ago under a leadership that was starting to speak things that started going, whoa, 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 and doing miraculous things. You're going, hold up a second. Let me think what Jesus is speaking about even here. And so Jesus says that this type of leader To this type of leader, only those who do the will of my Father will enter into the kingdom. And if you recall, in through the sermon, he's already given hints about what this would look like two times. Remember back in chapter 5, verse 20, he said, unless your righteousness, what, exceeds the experts in the law and the Pharisees, you need to exceed that to enter into the kingdom. It's not merely those who, quote, unquote, do the right things, right? There's more to the heart behind what's happening that shows the truth to one that is speaking. And also in chapter 10, right, during the Lord's Prayer, you remember, one of the things we are to pray is, your kingdom come, what? Your will be done. Whose will? The Father's will, right? But not only that, he's going to go on in, in chapter 12 of Matthew, 1250, Jesus is going to make a claim about this idea of the will of the Father. Those who know the will of the Father are going to be my mothers and brothers and and sisters and fathers. And he uses this familial relationship understanding of those who do the will of the Father are those who are what? Known. Those who Jesus knows. I think that's the key that you and I, and here's the hard thing, that's the key that you and I can't determine in this formula, is what? Not do we know Jesus, that's not what matters, it's what? Does Jesus know us? Does Jesus know the other person? And that's one thing, especially on the outside, and we love to look at fruit, but the problem is, is sometimes the fruit, we might miss that, but what we cannot say is what? Does Jesus know them? And so we gotta be careful sometimes in what we are doing in our fruit inspection. Only Jesus knows who he knows. But we can see signs, right? They use the title, Lord, Lord, which denotes familiarity. It's kind of like this idea of like when that double Lord there, it's not just only Lord, that he's king or he's somebody above, but it's a sense of you are my Lord. It's that double way of saying that, of like bringing it to an intimacy. You're my Lord. To which Jesus says what? I never knew you. They thought they were on good terms with Yahweh, but they were mistaken, weren't they? And why did they think they were on good terms with Yahweh and subsequently Jesus? Remember? Amazing things were done in Jesus' name, right? But all of these things are just mere, mere outward manifestations. And if we've seen anything in the, the Sermon on the Mount, it's over and over and over again. It's not just the outward only, right? But it's about the heart It's about not just the outward things, but the state of the heart from which the manifestations, its things come out. The manifestations are not wrong in themselves, right? The miracles, the things that are happening, the prophecies, they're not wrong in themselves. Jesus doesn't call them out and say, no, 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 don't do any of those things, right? He sends his own disciples out to do those those same exact things. And I think the acts themselves, they have power. Why? 
because they are the very words and property of Yahweh himself. They are his words that do the work, right? His words have power. Why? Because they're what? They're his words. They're from him. And I think here's the truth. The word of God, hear this, the word produces fruit wherever God desires it to produce fruit. Regardless of the vessel. Why? Because those words belong to Yahweh. The word is his power, and so it does not return void, right? Remember in chapter, what, what uh, Alan just read for us, 55, 11? In the same way, the promise that I make, Yahweh says, does not return to me having accomplished nothing. No, it is realized as I desired, and it is fulfilled as I intended. Isaiah 55, 11. But what if the word does not affect those who hear it? What if the words of Yahweh have not truly shaped the person that's giving them, right? Well, I want to take you with me. Go with me to James chapter 1. And if you want a good follow-up, I'm not going to preach on this, following up this, but a good follow-up to this Sermon on the Mount is go read the book of James. Study the book of James. It's almost like James said, okay, now that you've heard the sermon, let's put it into practice, all the things, okay? It's basically like his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. He heard it all, and he says, now this is how we live it out. But look at this in chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. He tells the reader, he says, be sure you live out the message and do not merely what? Listen to it. Where have we heard that? Right? Matthew 7. Don't merely listen to it and so deceive yourselves. Wait a second. I can deceive myself in merely hearing but not doing? Yes. He says, for if someone merely listens to the message and does not live it out, he is like someone who gazes at his own face in the mirror for he gazes at himself and then goes out and immediately forgets what type of person he was. You see how foolish it is. Like you walk, you see yourself ready to shave, and then you walk out without having done any shaving. Or you got the big old patch right here that people want to point out. Like, hey, you missed that, by the way. Right? But the one who peers into the perfect law of liberty and fixes his attention there and does not become a forgetful listener, but one who lives it out, he will be blessed in what? He does. Right? If you recall from the opening of the Sermon on the Mount, entrance into, excuse me, entrance into the kingdom is conditional on recognizing what? The poverty of spirit that we have. And conditional on what? Repentance. Repent for the kingdom is here. I think this is true. A relationship with Jesus is no less than walking in obedience to Christ's call. It's no less than being obedient, but it's also so much more than merely following a formula of works, right? You recall in the Old Testament how many times God says, right, they've got a book of Leviticus on how you are to bring your offerings to God, right? Do these things, fill these festivals, and all these things were prescribed for them, but then he also says on the flip side, what? I would rather have... Mercy, then what? Sacrifice. When David is confessing his sin in Psalm 51, he says a contrite heart, a broken heart and broken spirit is what you want over 10,000 rams, right? Well, which is it? Is it following the rules or is it having the true heart behind it? Yes. <laughs> right? These things seem a little contradictory at times, but you wouldn't you understand. But it's not merely giving the sacrifice with no heart behind it, but it's also that I'm not going to have a true heart and go, well, I don't need to do any of that, right? He wants both our heart and our obedience. So the first thing he's touching on is this idea of this balance between a heart behind it, that he knows us, but there's also something that we do in that. And so, but now going on 24 through 29, how do we know that the words have shaped us? How do we know the words have shaped others around us? It's like we, what we heard last week. We will know them by their fruit. Or to put it another way, we will know because the words of Yahweh have shaped us to do the will of the Father. Verse 21. And so he gives us two different 
scenarios. Yet again, two different ways that we can go, right? We hear the words of Jesus. He says, the one that hears the words and what? Does them. You'll be like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. And he says, sure, the rain is going to come. The flood, the winds of life still come. They still beat against your house. There'll still be very difficult times, but your house will not collapse. Your faith has shown to have held fast. Why? Because the foundation was on the rock. And what is the rock? What is the rock that we built our house on? The very words of Jesus that came from the Father. And you remember the word, and I say this as a capital W, the word is the power of Yahweh and is made manifest standing here on this mountain in this man, Jesus, right? John tells us in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And ironically, here you have Jesus is the word standing on the rock or this mountain speaking the words of Yahweh to the people of Yahweh. Jesus right here, I love this. I'm gonna go back to Isaiah 55. We're gonna hit this a couple times. Back to what Alan read. Look at verse one through three again. He says, all who are thirsty come to the water. You have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why pay money for what won't nourish Why spend your money on things that won't satisfy, right? Listen carefully to who? To me. Eat what's nourishing. Enjoy fine food. Pay attention and come to me. Listen so you can live, and I'll make a covenant with you. Jesus is embodying Isaiah 55 right here on this mountain. Come to me and listen. In Matthew 5, 6, he said, All who hunger and thirst... For righteousness will be what? Satisfied. Sounds a lot like Isaiah 55, doesn't it? Come and buy without money and you'll be satisfied with everything. The best that there is. Because Jesus satisfies those who hunger and thirst for his righteousness. And it comes as Yahweh's words through the very word of Yahweh. I think here the words of Jesus both And he says that he flips it around too, right? If you hear the words of Jesus and realize both crowds are here, right? Both people are sitting in the pew each week. Both crowds hear the words, same people, same pews, same mountain standing. But he says you hear them, but you do not do them. It's not just merely doing, but it's hearing the words. It's not merely those who are outside. He's talking to those who hear the same message. And the difference is, is what? Whether or not you weren't paying attention. Ah, I got you. I'm sorry. I don't mean to call you out. I thought you were on. You were, you were looking. I thought you were in. It's not just a matter of do, I mean, hearing, but it's doing, right? That's the thing. Do or do not. Yoda, right? There is no try. There's only do. But he says, that person that does not do them is like a foolish man. Why are you foolish? Because you know the truth, yet you what? I know the rock, but I like that sandy piece right over there. I'm going to go build on this sandy piece over here instead. You're a fool, right? Any of you that have built a house in North Texas in this area, especially in certain places, you know the differences in the foundation, don't you? (laughs) That heavy clay and some are on sand or whatever wreaks havoc. I had never in my life heard of foundation repair. And we build everything on the side of a mountain in West Virginia. Trust me. There's nothing that's on flat land. Everything's on the side of a mountain. Never heard of a foundation repair until I came here to Texas. On flat land, because it all moves. And Jesus says the rains are going to come. The floods are going to come. The things of life are going to still hit. The same people, right? Nobody's exempt. But his house will collapse. But not only will it collapse, it will be what? Utterly destroyed. See, this person hears the words, as James 1.24 said, he's like a man who gazes at himself and immediately forgets what sort of person that he is. Once again, the Sermon on the Mount is sharing what Isaiah 55 says. Go back to verses 6 and 7. He says, seek Yahweh while he makes himself available. 
Call to him while he's ready, while he's nearby. The wicked need to abandon their lifestyle and sinful people, their plans. They should return to Yahweh, and he will show mercy to them and to their God, for he will freely forgive them. Seek why he's available. Jesus is standing here on the mountain. Call to him while he's nearby. The wicked abandon the lifestyle. Sinful people, their plans, right? You are to be poor in spirit. You are to be merciful. You are to repent. Return to him, right? And he'll show mercy. And he freely forgives, right? The merciful will be what? Show mercy. This is all about obedience to the Lord. Obeying him from a heart that seeks him. And I think what's really cool, sometimes we miss this. When we don't see, we don't know what's going on at the time. I think we miss that his first hearers probably would have heard some of the words behind what Jesus is saying here. Behind this dramatic picture that he's giving, building a house on a rock. Because what, not far away from where he sat on that hillside, no more than 100 miles away, what? In Jerusalem, Herod's men were what? At this time, doing what? Anybody know their history? What was Herod doing during the time of Jesus? He was rebuilding the temple. The temple that, he was, that Jesus goes to was not the same one that was built at the same level that Zerubbabel and them built in the Old Testament. He was expanding it out into his beauty and all that it was. He's in the middle of building the, the temple. And he says that he spoke, to, he spoke about it as God's house and declared it was built upon a rock, proof against wind and weather. And in Jesus' very last sermon in Matthew, in this book, anybody know what Jesus' message is about the temple? That it's going to come what? Crashing down. Why? Because Israel as a whole had failed to respond to his message. I think these, the people heard just as much that it's not, remember, the temple is here, the temple is here, the temple is here, Jeremiah 7. It doesn't matter if your temple, if your thing is built, house is built on the wrong thing, it will collapse. But I love, halfway through Matthew, just a few chapters after this, there's a dramatic moment at Caesarea Philippi where Peter's word says to Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says, rightly you've said this, and upon what? This rock, your profession of who I am, this rock, I will build something very different. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What is that he's building? the very community that believes in him as Messiah. I think indeed it's no wonder that the people were amazed because Jesus spoke to them as one with authority, it says. Unlike the experts in the Torah or the Pharisees, those who only could quote somebody else and say, it's maybe like this, they, he was able to speak with authority. Here's one who has taken the beauty of the Old Testament with the Torah and the prophets, and brought it afresh. New, complete, he says, to those who have the privilege to hear the words of life for the very first time. These words. Jesus was heralding a holy message from a mountain about entering the kingdom of heaven. And his message echoes and reaches all the way down to us today. And the question is, are we listening? I want to take a minute. I want to go back and I want to look just a little bit more. You know, Alan talked, read to us that whole of Isaiah 55. And I want to finish by taking a quick look, walk through it, and I think it gives us a beautiful glimpse into what Jesus has taught in the sermon. And it's yet just another example of what? How Jesus is not teaching anything new here, is he? Yet it's completion, it's a completion of what was told from old. I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but I want to kind of touch it. I'm going to have it up here for your, those of you that are, are you know, note takers. You can take a picture or whatever. But I love, you know, verses 1 through 3, he's saying, come to me if you're hungry and thirsty. What? You'll be satisfied, right? Well, the sermon begins that the crowds, they knew who Jesus was, and they came, right? They came to the mountain and to teach those 
who had come to him to learn. He's fulfilling Isaiah 55. Here is Yahweh standing before them, giving his words. Not only that, verses 4 through 5 and 8 through 9, he's a witness, right, to the nations. And his plans are not like ours, right? They are far above. They are so much more than we could do. Well, what about in the sermon? He came to fulfill the law and the prophets, didn't he? All that this was talking about, he came to fulfill it. His righteousness goes what? Beyond the experts in the law and the Pharisees. And at the end here, we see he spoke unlike any other teacher. His ways are so far above. What about in 6 and 7? He's, he's talking about seek him while he's available, right? Abandon all your sinfulness. Find mercy. Find forgiveness in him. One of the sermon, he's talked about it to us about being what? Poor in spirit. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness, mourning over our sin. That the pure in heart will what? Seek after him. The whole thing in chapter five of all that you've heard it said, but I say to you, or what? Seeking right relationships with one another, abandoning the lesser things for the deeper heart behind it. Chapter six, he says, seek the heavenly things, not the things of earth. Remove the planks from our eyes, right, so we can see clearly to our brother and sister. He says in the the prayer, forgive others as we are forgiven, right? We find forgiveness and mercy in him. What about verses 10 and and 10 and 11? He talks about the snow and the water come and producing crops, yielding fruit in the seasons, and not being anything that would go without it having produced what it's supposed to, right? Right? Well, Yahweh, Jesus said he sends rain on the good and the evil. All receive it. The kingdom pursuit provides for our needs, doesn't it, right? Whatever it is what we need, he will provide it if we seek him in his kingdom. He talks about powerful deeds, but a lack of relationships, a lack of fruit. He talks about the storms hitting, but the house stands firm. And he finishes, and he says, you will go out with joy. You will be led along in peace. Mountains and hills will give a joyful shout before you. All the trees in the field will clap their hands. Evergreens will grow in places of thorn bushes. Firs will grow in place of nettles. There will be a monument to Yahweh, a permanent reminder that will remain. He says, you are the peacemakers. They are the children of God. He says, you will recognize others by their fruit, whether it be good or bad. Will we be peacemakers who go out and sharing the message, right? Over and over and over, Jesus is coming and saying, are we listening carefully and learning from the message of hope from our King of Kings? For this is the only way to have a firm foundation through the trials of this world. The only thing that will hold us fast. Through this sermon, Jesus is fulfilling the law and the prophets here. He brings it to its fullness and its completion. So over and over, the prophets spoke about what? This continuous, unbreaking cycle of what? All of us as humanity serving idols instead of Yahweh, instead of our true creator, thus perpetuating the reign of death that is in our lives, right? And over and over, no man could permanently stop this cycle, but there is one. It says there is one who is coming in the line of David and will reign forevermore and will put to end all of the things that we fear. And here, King Jesus sits on a mountain unfolding the way to everlasting life in the kingdom of heaven. It's not merely a future promise, but one that began with him and continues with us today. Amen? Amen. And we can be shaped and challenged by the word we listen to and hold dearly in our hearts. So I'm going to repeat the question and end here. Are we listening? You heard me. I saw that. You heard me. (laughs) Are we listening to his word? And are we putting into practice the things he calls us to? That's the beauty of what we get to live out. Amen?
man, I am so thankful that we get called out together to live in this life together. And we do it side by side. What a privilege. What a privilege it is to get to do, live this life in the kingdom with you all. And I get to do it forever. And I'm excited. Let's pray.